the key my sails, the anchor in the wind. 
The 
Lord, I just thank you that you are high above it all, all kingdoms, all powers, all authority. You are above it all. You are high and lifted up, but Lord, it's, it's our vision, it's our sight, it's our perception that needs to be lifted up to see you above it all, all the circumstances, all the things that have created chaos for our lives, Lord. You're above it all, so open our eyes to see that you are high that you are above it all. You're in all and through all, and you reign with all power and authority. Help us to receive that into our lives. Open our eyes to see how truly exalted you are above it all.
Thank you. 
I need one of these. Um, I also, <laughs> I'm thinking, uh, I ought to look at the schedule and see who's doing communion today. And I went, oh, it's me. <laughs> it's like, oh, like 10 minutes ago. Uh, um, uh, Rafina just saying, I want to know you more. Is that correct? Um, so um, I was going to talk about the Lord's Supper. There's a, there's a difference between supper and dinner.
dinner and supper are both used to refer to the main meal of the day and especially to that meal eaten in the evening. Supper is used especially when the meal is an informal one or intimate one, is what I would say, uh, eaten at home, while dinner tends to be the term chosen when the meal is more formal. So have you ever heard of the taking the Lord's dinner? I haven't. Uh, and supper is an old term. It's an old... Um, I had grandparents that were farmers, and they ate dinner at noon, supper in the evening. And But anyway, so we're, we're about to come up and get the elements for the Lord's Supper. And I just, I don't know, that came, came to mind, you know, like, look up what supper means. Supper is intimate. Supper is, you know, I think some people have turned communion into dinner. Somebody even administers it to you, you know, it's like. So anyway, I encourage you to, um, well, a couple things. To, to, last night we had our grandson, Doc, over. He's seven years old. And he goes, I don't want to go into church. It makes me, I go, what, does it make you nervous or what? And he goes, yeah, it makes me really nervous. I said, it's probably because the Holy Spirit makes you nervous. And so we talked about the Holy Spirit. And he, go, he goes to St. Rose, or did. And I said, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? The triune God. Uh-huh. You know, it's like, I said, well, and I think the Holy Spirit can, it's supposed to be the comforter and the teacher and a bunch of stuff, but it also can make you like, like, you know, nervous. And, and I, I just pray that you just let it happen to you. Let it happen. Let whatever happens, happen. And it's just like today, I called up George Sheffy, my friend, that I think you guys, some of you may know him. So he's been in the hospital for two weeks. He almost died. And I told Lisa today, he, he's a flight attendant. What happened to him, he lost so much blood because he had diverticulitis. That could have happened on the plane. And if it happened on the plane, he would have died. And so... And they saved half of his colon. This surgeon was a believer. She prayed with him. And so just wanted to give you that report. But anyway, I was just like, I started like crying and I could hardly pray. For, I prayed for him because, you know, so many times we'll go, I'm, and I have been praying for him a lot, but, oh, I'm, I'm going to be praying for you. Why not? You're talking to the guy. Why not? Why wouldn't you pray for him? Like, so I, of course, do it, but I could hardly get it out. I was like, ah, I'm crying. And so Doc comes out of the living room, goes and puts his hand on my leg because he was like, and prayed for me. It was like, so I said, well, that was the Holy Spirit. Didn't, is, why did you come out and pray for me? And so anyway, sorry, going on a little long here, but, um, so if you would come up and get the elements, then I'm going to read you a little portion of scripture and we'll take the elements together. And then there's the offering containers up here. So come on up.
wouldn't it be nice to do communion like we used to do it? <laughs> this COVID-friendly stuff is getting old. Um, I think somebody said gave me an amen on that one. Um, uh, so anyway, here's a familiar, hopefully I can see this. Um, the heading is the Lord's Supper. So now that I've realigned you on what supper means. Um, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So you do have your bread. I'm not going to try to. I'll do it later. Um. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then there's a, this is God's word. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he might remind you of something while taking communion that you need to say you're sorry for or say, you know, and I, sorry, Lord, you know, I do this a a lot, believe me. Um, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord is in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That's pretty, pretty harsh. That's pretty... But God is a perfect father. He's not going to dump like 20 things on you. He might remind you of something that you need to clear up or start working on or continue working on. So that's my take on that. It's like, so anyway, um, pray with me. Lord, I, I thank you for th- that we can have supper with you. And that I'm so thankful for this group of people and this the way we do church. Not that we're like better than other people. I just do like the way we go about doing things here. And that we can have an intimate supper with you. And we love you and trust you with our lives and our future, Lord. And um, just thank you and just bless the rest of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. And... You can't get rid of me. Um, Patrick and Kurt, I, I got a call from Kim Taft today, and she has a nephew, so she has a sister that she has a broken relationship with, but she has a son, Jeff Brown? Oops. Yeah. Well, anyway, he's like, she's some. he's somebody that she raised part of his life. Like, he went to Rainier High or something and lived with her when she lived in Rainier he fell off a ladder, but he fell off a ladder because he had cardiac arrest. So he's in some sort of a holding, like they lower your temperature, they do something. So he's got a very small chance of living. He's like a 50 year old guy. Got kids, kids here and kids there. But, um, and she has a she really wants to see him, but she'd just flown not long ago and had this tremendous pressure problem, like piercing crazy ear thing. So anyway, Lord, we pray for Kim. She wants to see her nephew. She, she has a relationship with him, but she can't go because she's freaked out about getting this pain in her ear. And so I, I prayed with her on the phone, but I do lift her up to you because we can all agree whether we even – most of us know Kim, but we can agree that you would um, straighten this out, help this to happen. We ask you to heal her ear and and also heal, heal. There's always hope. Things can always get better. You you know we don't understand. You know your ways are not our ways. Sometimes you choose to heal. Sometimes you don't. We are supposed to be like children and come before you and ask for the the miracle. Ask for the the best thing. And so we do that, and we ask that in your name. Amen.
because that's something I'm actually super passionate about. Hold on just one second, I gotta sign into my computer. And this does actually relate to the Bible too as well, because um, in the Bible, God had a lot of emotions when he described himself in Exodus, when he first revealed himself to Moses, that's one of the first thing he said. He's, he's compassionate, he's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And then he goes on to talk about generational sin, so our generational sin. So he's lovely. Um, like I liked what Mike was saying earlier, uh, just kind of like God will bring up some stuff in us, even if we think it's not there. That's been the season that I've been going through recently is uh, just kind of revisiting some stuff that I thought, all right, this is this is gone. This is out of my life. And he's like, well, not exactly. So he does that a lot. At least he does that in my life. Um, <laughs> so Matthew 7, 21 through 23 is it's one of my favorite passages in scripture. And it's pretty intense as well, which is why it is one of my favorite passages. People see it. I don't. I guess I don't know if people see this as a negative passage in a sense. I don't. I love it because when I'm reading it, um, it brings things up in me and it reminds me just how much I need Jesus, how much I need other people, and how important it is for me to be vulnerable in those relationships, which is can be very uncomfortable at times. And I think a lot of people here do a really good job of being vulnerable. Um, so... I'm going to read the passage. And so Matthew 7, 21 through 23. And we're going to talk about our true selves. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Hi. Do you want to go over there with Fina? Go over with Rafina. <laughs> um, so there's one word that I want to hone in on today, which is new. That is a very important word. And um, in the Greek, the word is gnosko, which means having a relational, personal, intimate knowledge of who someone is. So it means to know to come to know, to understand. And um, so I guess a good example of what this looks like would be marriage. After being married for 20 plus years, you know that person inside and out. You know the good parts of them. You know the not so good parts of them. Uh, super rough. Like I've been married. I was with someone for seven years and I knew that person. They knew me. They knew all my stuff. I knew all of their stuff. And so um, and it's, it's a lovely thing at the same time. It's great. It can be very grating. And I think that's the place where probably the most vulnerable would be in marriage. Um, so I want to tell a story and it was a story I heard on a podcast most recently. If you guys listen to, uh, Pete Scazzaro, he's wonderful. He's a big emotional health church guy. I love it. And he told this story of a guy named Martin Buber. And Martin had just come out of this wonderful experience with God. Like imagine the most majestic, probably like Toronto, the Toronto blessing kind of stuff is what he came out of. Um, miracles, I, I don't know. And right after that, he had a, a boy approach him, a young man approach him with some questions about his life. And Martin was not really present with the boy when he approached him because he was more concerned with his experience and himself. And then as it turns out later, the boy committed suicide. Not to say that it's completely Martin's fault because he, that kid probably had a lot of stuff going on inside of him. So Martin was involved in things beyond the earthly experience of, of life. He was caught up in heaven. Unfortunately, he was not fully present to this, this young guy, and he was preoccupied with his experience with God. What he gave um, this kid was a non-present presence and the leftovers from his experience with God. He didn't show up to the relationship to be seen and known. 
So the reason the boy committed suicide, one or one of the reasons the boy committed suicide, wasn't because he didn't pray enough. It wasn't because someone didn't cast a demon out from him, but it was partly, and maybe you know maybe that could have been done, but it was partly because he didn't have a place to be known by someone. Um, he didn't know Jesus, and I don't know. Maybe Jesus knew him in his last moments, kind of like. I don't know what happens with people in their last moments of life. I know that's like a very intimate thing between Jesus and someone else. I think Jesus could reveal himself um, to to the kid, in fact. But what this boy needed was uh, someone safe to walk with him through his questions and through his pain. He needed to process his thoughts, the pain, and discharge these things going on in his life with some consistency. Uh, The boy was a vulnerable person who was met by invulnerability. When someone has a safe place to uh, talk through their pain, statistics statistics say they almost always make a full recovery from whatever trauma they experience. You could suffer the craziest kind of trauma, and if you have a safe place and safe people, chances are you will make a recovery. Not to say that that stuff's not gonna maybe affect you your whole life or think about those things going on in your head, but it could, you know, range from, you know, rape, child abuse, abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse. The the worst kinds of pain can be overcome through um, emotional connection, vulnerability, relationship. So this very experience with this boy led Martin to change everything about his life. And he wrote a book called I Thou. I just got done reading it. It's it's a very interesting read. There was a lot of good stuff in it, but um, maybe try reading through it. It's pretty good. The book talks about interpersonal encounters and how we can only become our true selves in relationship with other people. Because who we are in relationship to another person becomes either more fragmented or unified. Um, And by that, you know, if um, someone has a painful relationship with somebody and there's a lot of pain, turmoil, you know, uh, maybe there's manipulation or whatever is going on, their selves become more fragmented. They become wounded. And um, I was going to say, I'm I'm, going to say it later because that's in there later, but Um, If you have a loving relationship with someone, with Jesus, with other people, you can go to someone, you can be your vulnerable self, be be who it is that he created you to be, um, whomever that is, and you feel safe, there's a unification of your whole self, whether that be physically, emotionally, spiritually. So um, the kind of relationship that Martin envisioned in his mind after meeting with the boy was this. It was one of mutuality directness, presentness, and ineffability. I had to look up what ineffability meant because I was like, what in the heck is that? Which I needed a word for this because I say this all the time where I'll go through, I have like these moments with Jesus and I'm like, Jesus, I don't know how to describe what it is that I just experienced with you. There's like, it's like, if I feel whole, I feel loved, I feel seen, but like, I don't have a word because there's no words that I can string together to encompass exactly it is how you feel about me and how I feel about you. And this word, it, I know it's not a pretty word though, so I don't really like it, but it means, <laughs> it's so ugly. <laughs> it means <laughs> that, Um, ideas that cannot or should not be expressed in spoken words, which I love that. I love that. So thank you, God, for giving me that word, even though it's ugly. Um, (laughs) So so he also said that these relationships, healthy relationships, are characterized by transparency, vulnerability, and being accessible. It's in these kinds of relationships where we become fully human um, and aren't people or we're not people seen as a means to an end or an object to be influenced Um, in narcissistic relationships. People are most often seen, which narcissism is a um, in the, I think the DSM five manual. It's it's like a pattern of behavior over time. 
that is like from your upbringing, you have this pattern of behavior over time and it's out of someone's insecurity that they're actually narcissistic and sometimes it comes off as actually egotistical in a way. So you wouldn't know that someone is pretty insecure um, based upon someone's outward mannerisms, but inside they are, which is why they would use other people as an object or as a means to an end to, to fulfill them in some way, shape or form. So typically what happens in these kinds of relationships is that someone, like I said, someone is used as a means to an end um, uh, for that person and then they are discarded when they, they are of no value to the person or the mission at hand. So <clears throat> the main reason, like I said, this happens is because of a personality pattern of relating to the world and it's because of pathological insecurity. So this is one of the patterns that Martin kind of recognized in himself and he decided, I wanna change. I wanna change because of the, the trauma from the experience uh, with that young kid. So the day, the day the boy died was the day that Martin found out who he really was, not just who he said he was because he saw the gap um, in the two greatest commandments that Jesus has given us, which is love the Lord God with all your you know, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. We, those are not separated from each other. They're intertwined together. Um, so even though Martin was a leader, he was not his true self. He was unaware that he was pretending to be something on the outside, that he was not on the inside. And this was revealed to him through relationship um, with people. God brought it to his attention and it was revealed through his relationships in this real life. So he was emotionally, spiritually immature and his life wasn't producing the kind of good fruit that is talked about in the Bible. In a sense, uh, the trauma of his relationship with the boy sent him into an inner healing process to become more present, more transparent, more ac accessible, and more vulnerable to the people that were around him. And I s tell this story because it's very similar to that of the people approaching Jesus in Matthew 7, where they approach him and they're like, Lord, Lord, we did all of these things for you. And he looks at them and he's like, I never knew you. You claim to know me but I don't know you. And it was their invulnerability that produced this because there's an in, the vulnerability that comes along with intimacy and relationship. So they weren't aware of who they were in relation to themselves, in relation to other people, and especially in relation to Jesus. They lacked awareness of their feelings and what Jesus was wanting for their lives relationally uh, they may have moved past their limits by doing more work for Jesus than he was requiring from them. They seem to lack the ability to personally enter into the lives of the people that they were ministering to. As you can see in the passage itself, I this, I that, I this, I that. There wasn't a lot of mention of um, yeah, we were talking to so-and-so today and through this and this relationship over time, all of this healing, it was more about them than it was the other person. And I think Jesus was trying to point that out to them as he was saying, I never knew you. Um, so what they professed was correct. Jesus does miracles. Jesus heals people. Jesus casts out demons and these spiritual things that are going on behind the scenes that we don't even see. Um, I mean, I've had some crazy dreams in the past few years and now it's kind of nice because I finally have a place to talk about them because I didn't grow up in a family of believers and so I would just have the craziest dreams that would happen in real life and I didn't have a place to put that. And I was like, okay, God, maybe you're real, but I don't know, but do I talk to you about this? So he does those things, he really does those things. What he's trying to get them to understand in the passage though is that the vulnerability, the relationship matters in connection with um, the miracles and the work and all of the beautiful, magnificent stuff that he does to heal, heal our hearts and our lives. So, um, 
So the truth of the matter is that in order for connection to happen in life, in order for us to truly be ourselves, the people he's made us to be, it's important to be vulnerable and be seen by him and by other people. So God himself dwells inside of us. When we meet Jesus, he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. He searches our ha- our hearts out and he looks for any way inside of each one of us that doesn't look like him. And he takes that out and sometimes it's painful, really painful, and he puts more of himself inside of us, which is can be a grueling process, but it's a beautiful process if we'll allow it to happen. He's the initiator. So in order to be our true self, we need a lot of courage, a lot of courage. And that courage, the word courage comes, uh, it's a, the root word in Latin is cur. And this means our whole heart. And the definition of cur- courage back in the day is to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. So when we come to Jesus, we tell the story because he is the safest place in the world. We go to him and we say, hey, this is who I am with my whole heart. And he willingly accepts us, loves us, forgives us, and walks with us as we are in process. Part of that, though, is being vulnerable and honest about um, the difficult, the imperfect parts of our lives. Because the difference between people um, that Jesus knows and the ones that he doesn't know are that the people that he knows have the courage to be imperfect, which seems kind of weird because it's like Jesus is perfect, but I'm imperfect, but I come to him and I'm imperfect. Is he going to love me? I don't know. Of course he's going to love you. Of course he's going to love you because he is perfection and he has the perfect love and he has the perfect love to withstand um, any weird thing that's going on in our life and he has the perfect love to heal all of that. So uh, the people Jesus says he doesn't know, they weren't able to let go of the idea of who they thought they were and who they thought Jesus wanted them to be. They were invulnerable, closed off, more concerned with getting the work done that Jesus had sent them to do. Um, And I want to work, give the definition of like an emotionally healthy person and an uh, emotionally unhealthy person just to give us kind of some framework and there's you can probably add a heck of a lot more to these definitions as well but this is just some of the things that I thought of so an emotionally unhealthy person they lack awareness of their feelings their weaknesses and limits they don't understand how their past impacts the present and how others experience them they lack the capacity and skill to enter into d- deeply into feelings and the perspectives of others. And then they carry these immaturities with them into their communities and everything that they do. An emotionally healthy person who produces good fruit is characterized by these things. They're in tune with their emotions and feelings. They listen empathetically to others and they share from their heart. They speak clearly, honestly, respectfully on their own behalf. They value everyone's dignity. They're self-included as human beings made in the image of God through self-respect and self-care. They walk in community respecting each person's uniqueness. They receive constructive criticism without becoming defensive or being in denial. They live in truth and embrace their limits as a gift and are willing to initiate and repair relationships as much as humanly possible when a relationship has been ruptured. So, um, I notice I say so a lot, geez. <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know, people say like, so, da, 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 da. I say so, sheesh. That's another thing I'm working on. Um, what Jesus said to the people who approached him in Matthew 7 uh, was that in spite of the miracles, in spite of all the wonderful things you've done in my name, I don't know you as someone who is close to me and who is a true follower. So, <laughs> there we did. I did it again, guys. See, I'm becoming aware. I'm becoming aware. <laughs> All right. Um, 
I was listening to this podcast the other day. Um, it was called Dadville. And the only reason I listened to it was because John Mark Comer, he's a pastor in Portland and Bridgetown. <laughs> he was speaking on there because I'm like, I'm listening to a dad podcast. What am I doing? But John Mark Comer was, I love him and I love the things that he talks about. So one of the things that he was talking about in the podcast was how him and his church family and um, like his family in general, they were being afflicted by a lot of demonic stuff that was going on. Like people, he said people were manifesting stuff. I, I don't know. He said it was crazy. So he contacted somebody who was a professional in, you know, that kind of the spiritual realm and they had dealt with a lot of you know encounters where they were casting out demons or things like that of that nature and john mark said that when he asked this guy for advice what the guy said to him was something he wasn't expecting and it was this emotional trauma is the gateway for the demonic so by having relationships we healthy relationships we can negate what the enemy is doing right off the start of the bat right out of the gate because emotional trauma i mean if we look at it like that it wreaks all kinds of havoc physically emotionally mentally and it is very spiritual in nature in my opinion um because the enemy wants to see nothing more than people's lives ruined, manipulated, lies, um, deception. That's how he operates. That's how he operates. They called him the father of lies. I'm forgetting where it's at in scripture. It's in Matthew somewhere, I think. But that's who he is. He's the father of lies. So, of course, all of this stuff would start with emotional trauma. So repairing relationships is the start uh, where Jesus kind of starts in a sense. Um, this is why self-awareness is important, having and having deep relationships is important. Uh, and we as a body of Christ are set up for relational healing. And this includes miracles, prophecy, you know, casting weird things out. That's who we are. That's who Jesus says that we are. Um, but being our false self, not our true self, and not having the vulnerability that goes with that, I think a lot of um, interesting things can happen in life. So being our false self um, typically stems from family trauma early on in our lives, and it doesn't get dealt with, and it makes its way into our new family of Christ. And healing from our past is a gift from Jesus is a complete gift from Jesus that we have. Um, we have all these tools now. We have all of this information, this wealth of knowledge um, that people didn't have, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. And so these things just kept repeating themselves and repeating themselves and repeating themselves and repeating themselves. And we have the gift as followers of Jesus to kind of nip that in the bud and, and, and stop those, those generational patterns from happening over and over and over again. And this doesn't take away from our relationship with Jesus, working through the hard stuff. It doesn't take away. It adds to, and it adds to our relationship with other people as well. Um, I went to counseling. I started going to counseling when I was in my 20s. Um, I went for a few years, and then I stopped for about like three or four years. And then I just realized, nope, I'm going to start going again. So I'm like, all right, I need to go again. Because I've had people say to me, like, all you need is Jesus. And I'm like, yeah. And he's given me the gift of going. I can go to counseling. Like, I'm blessed. I get to be able to, like, learn these ways of thinking. And I get to renew my mind through these patterns. And he's with me. And he's helping me. And he's caring about me as I'm walking through all this really difficult stuff. Um, so that was kind of the second point that I want to make is in order for us to be our true selves, sometimes we have to go back before we move forward in order to grow. And again, this is, uh, Exodus 34, six through seven says this, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, 
slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiven iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of, on the fathers of the fathers, on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So generational sin, trauma, it is a real thing and it is, it's a pathway that has opened up um, like, like John Mark was saying, like what that guy said, it's a pathway for the demonic to come in by not having that relational healing. Uh, we've seen many fall, like m many leaders fall in the past year, whether it be, there was this one pastor, um, Rafina and I listened to this podcast of this, uh, Steinbe Steinbeck, I think is her last name, Kayla. And he was a pastor. Yeah. He was a pastor in California and he ended up committing suicide. Um, there was another guy, Ravi Zacharias, when I lived in Europe, my friends were like super into apologetics, super into Ravi. They went in, I was actually going to go, but I couldn't that week. And they went over to this military base and went and saw him speak. And, and then everything comes out about Ravi this year where he falls. And in this, he hid hundreds of pictures of women and there were many allegations against him. Uh, he used where he used money for massages to and frequent overseas trips to hide his abusive behaviors. He was building trust through spiritual uh, connection. Um, and he not only did he physically hurt people, but he used his position to emotionally manipulate people in the name of God. And these things are difficult to talk about um, because it's deep, it's difficult, it's weighty to kind of wade through and we never want to think the worst things about people. It's a reality though, and it's a reality that's been happening for quite a long time, um, this kind of abuse, and not even just by people who are in power. Um, so Ravi, he was protected by an institution and his behavior and his behavior was enabled by an institution and the people who were part of that. And that's not our call as Christians is to protect um, people in power or people who are abusing other people, we're to forgive, we're to love. Um, but I would say we are to challenge the authority of the day in a most loving way. Um, we are su supposed to protect the vulnerable as following the example of Christ. We're to listen to the voices of people who've been physically hurt, emotionally hurt, uh, manipulated or abused at the hands of others, at the hands of um, leaders um, inside or outside the body of Christ. And just because someone performs miracles or does like the most crazy things, which they do happen and Jesus will do those things and he'll allow people to do those things in his name because that's his nature. He's good. He wants people. He wants to see people healed. Um, but he might say something to someone like that. I never knew you. And it's our responsibility as a family, as people who love each other, um, to encourage that vulnerability, that intimacy, um, no matter who the person is. So, I keep doing it. The people approaching Jesus, they went through a devastating blow in order for them to become fully aware to the truth of who they were. They were seemingly unaware that they were operating in a way that wasn't going to lead them any closer to the heart of God, nor were they truly healing people. And that's pretty intense what we just walked through. So I want to leave everyone with a little bit of hope and then we'll pray and wrap this up. Um, Jesus wants to know our true self. He wants to know our vulnerable side. He wants to know the things we struggle with. Um, he wants to know the things that make us tick. He wants to know the things that we're passionate about and crazy about and care about, the things that make us feel alive inside. He loves us and he wants to know everything. He wants us to be fully seen, fully known, and fully loved by him. That is the kind of savior he is. Um, and he's not scared of our humanness in that way. He's really not afraid of it. He came down as the most vulnerable. He came down as a baby. That is so vulnerable. Like Mary had to take care of him or he wouldn't have survived. That is so vulnerable. And the God of the world 
the God who loves us. <laughs> Sorry. Like, that's so amazing that he did that. Um, so he came as a vulnerable little baby and grew up into a man and a man who cared for the vulnerable. He cared for the people who were despised, the people who were cast out. He cares for people like us. Um, so we have the opportunity to be fully loved and fully known by Jesus on a daily basis. And there are safe people in here. Um, there are safe people in this community who love Jesus, who are mo probably more than happy to take anyone in and just be like, hey, I want to know who you are. Um, and so there's opportunity for that. The catch is, and this is the catch that I've been wrestling through right now, there's no guarantee that your life will work out the way that you plan for it just because you're vulnerable and doing the things that Jesus has asked us to do. Um, because when we become vulnerable in our true self, it means we let go of the control of our life and our circumstances. To be our true self, uh, vulnerability is completely necessary. It's necessary to be connected to Jesus and to be connected to other people and it's the, of the utmost value in his kingdom. To be our true selves is to be seen, and vulnerability is not a weakness. In fact, it's a strength. And it's, it's a strength because it takes courage and the ability to show up and be seen when we cannot control the outcome. And I would say personally that it is our greatest measure of courage um, is to step out and be known be seen and be fully loved um, as we're journeying through life together with Jesus and uh, with one another. So I'm gonna pray for us and then we will be on our way. So Jesus, um, first off, I just wanna thank you that you came um, in such a vulnerable position. You, you made yourself low. Um, you didn't really you never took the high road. You never took the way of power. You loved the weak and the lowly. And even on the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, you encourage us to be meek. You encourage us uh, to be pure in heart. You encourage us um, to be these kinds of people who, who are able to walk, walk with the people who don't have um, any prestige or kind of honor. So I just ask that for everyone in here today, you give them the courage to be vulnerable, to step out in places in their relationship with you where maybe they're scared or um, maybe they're just confused or I don't know what's going on. I've been all in all of those places in my relationship with you lately. And um, I just pray that you'd comfort them and you would show them that you care about them in spite of all of the stuff that they may be walking through, whatever that is. Um, there's lots of stuff going on in this life and especially in this season with COVID and things are just seemingly getting back to normal. Um, just ask that you be patient with us as we're in process and that we'd be patient with each other. Uh, we want to grow. We want to know you more. We want to become more like you and just thank you so much for caring about us in Jesus name. Amen.